Hello, friends, family, and keepers of the faith to another Del Boy blog. Uh, this one is year two, blog 19, or in legacy numbers, blog 71. And it's dated the 2nd of July, 2023. And I didn't really have a problem hitting record today, although... I am feeling very tired. Now, I've mentioned before that I'm trying to build my energy levels up. Um, and this week was supposed to be an easy week. You know, a week where I'm doing a two-day week. Um, and that's because this month has been a mix of three days working, then two days working, then three days working, then two days working. And tomorrow I start the four-day period where I work for four days. And it must be just sleep and heat and all sorts of other things. that, And possibly things on my mind, um, which I can't quite put my finger on what they are. But I'm tending to find I'm getting four or five hours sleep now where eight is more what I'd like. But it's broken up sleep. And I was hoping that my energy levels for Monday would be a lot higher so that I get a good balance at the very beginning and just start to wane off around the third and fourth day. But I've got a funny feeling I'm going to have trouble on the second day, let alone the first um, and that's on my mind a little bit, but hey, look, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, my feelings, what I've been doing a little bit later on, because I like to get to the good stuff, and it seems that the good stuff is the questions and the shout outs and so forth, so we'll get the news out the way, shall we? Yes, let's get that news out the way. So, we always start off with the war, we always will, until basically we come to the end of that. Um, I've got my chicken scratch uh, listed down here. So what have I put? So the war. Top US military officer, Army General Mark Milley, said he was unsurprised that progress in Ukraine's counteroffensive was slower than some people some people and computers might have predicted. This is going to take six, eight, ten weeks. It's going to be very difficult and very bloody. Ukraine's counteroffensive is hobbled by lack of adequate firepower. Yeah, um, I didn't read too much about the war this week. The... I did uh, mention about this Wagner uh, civil unrest, which seemed to be new hope. And that was at the beginning of the week and carried on for a few days. Uh, but then the attention moved to this counteroffensive that's been going on. And it seems very much that there seems to be a lack of resources, should we say. Um, I mean, at the very beginning, they said it was going to be very difficult, that it was um, going to be probably the hardest part of the war. Um, lots of casualties, that sort of thing. Toing and throwing. And they're complaining already about resources. Now, I do know that there's a, a lot of equipment that has been given a lot of training. Um, I didn't find it very clear whether what they meant by resources was the right type of tanks, the right type of aircraft, the right type of weapon, or whether it's general, we haven't got enough of anything. Um, but all I know is, is that we want the war to end. Um, if that can end around a table, great. Um, and... That's that's what I'm hoping for. And so we'll move on from the war 
wishing them well. Um, our thoughts are with them. And move to another little article which was in the news this week. There's probably much bigger and greater articles around, but this one was about the sugar tax, so it interested me a little bit. Uh, iced coffee drinks sold by high street chains contain more sugar than a can of Coke, a study has found. The study showed that certain frappes and frappuccinos from Cafe Nero, Costa and Starbucks command more than the adults' daily recommended allowance. Fizzy drinks have since 2018 been under a sugar tax and campaigners state these cafe drinks should follow suit. Well, hell yes. Uh, about time if you've got a sugar tax and I remember it coming in and I was going bloody hell that's put the price of those up then and there is more sugar in in these coffee drinks then they should follow suit um, especially if they make them in the shop themselves I mean I've always thought to myself, canned frappe drinks, you know, these coffee drinks that you get in cans, I think they already do fall into the sugar tax bracket. But um, I do know that they make these in store. They know exactly what's in them because I've, I've, I've recognised that the coffee shops are quite good at basically telling you the ingredients of things, especially with nut allergies and so forth. So they they know what sugar is in these products. And just because you make it in there means that you should follow suit. If you know that you're always going to be putting two tablespoons of sugar into something, then you know it's as bad as the can that's ready made. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, sugar tax them. It's a, You've got to have a fair battlefield. You can't get away with that. Um... Now, that might seem bad because nobody likes tax, but I'm also one of these people that thinks to myself, as much as I can control my destiny with what I buy, um, I'm not forever looking at labels. And if I go in for a coffee and I put my own sugar in it, fair enough. Otherwise, I think to myself, there's no sugar in it right and if there is because there's ingredients in there that's ready got those sugar elements in them then i'm going to lose track of how much sugar that's in there um and if manufacturers have to apply then it should be in everything else so yeah i'm i hate tax but if it's if it makes us put less sugar in things and we all then are healthier, are the oblige. Do you know what I mean? I look at it a little bit like that. Um, my diet's terrible. So something that forces me out a little bit because of price, probably a good thing, you know? But then again, we don't have too many good things to laugh and like about at the moment, do we? I mean, uh, just to let you know, I've got my orange juice back. Freshly squeezed. They finally got them back in. Ah, lovely. And um, that's my start of the day. I don't generally um, have a coffee anymore um, or a cup of tea. I generally have a cup of tea in the afternoon. I'll have a coffee mid-morning as a treat. But I usually start my day off with an orange juice. Uh, and I drink far too many cans when I get home. Uh, and it's always the diet stuff, Pepsi Max and stuff. Terrible, really. But I need to have some luxury, some goodness uh, for my day. So I'll end the news bar there and get to the nice stuff, the shout outs. And. As you know, I, I love the shout-outs. The, the shout-outs to me um, is the complimentary side of things because I'm one of those people that 
recognize that a fiver is 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 a lot of money a pound is a lot of money because anybody who hasn't got a pound when they need one is broke you know um but time is a commodity you can't pay back and these people that i'm about to mention and i hope i haven't missed anybody have taken their time to go hey i watched your blog really liked it and here's my little comment and i might even have a question for you so brilliant uh i love all of that it it keeps me going it's one of those things where you have to have a spur to keep moving forward and the shout outs do it for me so without further ado the shout outs this week are stevie paperboy martroid Roberts Retro Gaming, Colin Jones, um, slash Ponder, Play Tendo Guy, Seb's Place, Milfy Swinbuckle, Paul Patrick, LFC Gamer and Vlogs, Down the Rabbit Hole, Steve's Gaming, Denny, David's Retro Games Played Badly, Charlie Angel, and Cauldron of Stardust. Thank you so much, guys, for commenting. Um, I haven't done too much video output, so I will check in a moment that I haven't missed anybody because I'll be getting to the questions. So hopefully I'm not going to miss anybody. The last two weeks have been difficult. Um, not only have I run out of energy towards the end and I've missed certain stuff, Um I tend to find that I can sometimes get a bit muddled towards the end anyway. Um, I'm trying to monitor that today. I hope my face is sort of like showing that I'm awake still at the moment. Um, like I say, I think it's pure um, dry air, um, not enough sleep, um, notes not in a good way, even though I do a prep the night before. But I'm tending to find I've got less time um, as the summer comes along and I need to do more in the garden. But we'll talk about more stuff that I've done for myself and for you guys towards the end of the blog. Um, but I have to make an apology to Doug Scullery because he said for the last couple of weeks, I've missed his questions out. Um, so I put a reminder of myself here. And I even missed my mate Denny last week. And he had a big topic, which I'm going to touch upon. So I'm going to just change my view now a little bit. Hopefully I'm not going to damage anything with uh, how I've got things laid out. And go to a couple of where I think these questions are. And look for Doug. So just bear with me a moment. So there's that one and the comments. And we'll look for Doug. There's Doug at the bottom there. And it's got, and this is from a, a walking video from two weeks ago. And it says, uh, great walkie talkie Dell, keep them coming. Dell's Retro Ramble might be a name. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to sort of do a poll one day, I think, of uh, some of the some of the sort of like names I give things because really I've already mentioned that I love doing my uh, arcade years, my 8-bit years, um, and you know that once I get going with that, I'll be turning to 16-bit years, and there will be console years. There might be a PC years, but that fits at the moment under random gameplay and streams. So we'll see with that, because I do buy an awful lot of Steam stuff, and I do like to highlight a game or two uh, that I've recently bought, you know? Because they're so cheap these days, you can get them through Fanatical and Humble Bundle and all sorts of charity bits where you can buy 10 games for literally pence. Um, but I digress a little bit. Um, he's put here, Doug, 
If possible, maybe look into fixing the clunk clunk noise as you walk. I think it's your selfie stick. In fact, Doug, yes, I've mentioned it actually in the video itself. I said that I haven't got a selfie stick. I've got a sort of like a um, tripod in case I wanted to stop and pull, pull the legs out and do a little panning thing. Um, and the walking video just came about really because um, I kept talking about my walks. That's number one. And two, it was a bit different. And three, Main Meister, my mate, did did a couple in a field, and they seemed to be well liked. Um, it was nice to see his ugly, fa I mean, his face with fields behind him. <laughs> that wasn't a slip in the tongue. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I thought to myself. I keep talking about my walk and I do a walk every day and some people I'm pretty sure are going, the size of you doing a five mile walk, don't believe it. And it was important to me that at some point I did my walk, not for you guys really, it was more to do with showing my nephew and niece who this is what it's really aimed at, this blog. Uh some of the areas I go down and it might also bring a memory back to them on where they used to walk and ride their bikes because we all live in the same district. So that was the reason for that. But you've got here uh, something that says topic for next blog. What were the reasons for the failure of 3D TV in Britain? And would you agree with my assertion that it could never achieve mass adoption unless made possible with no extra gizmos required. No specs, no headsets, nothing. You simply sit in front of telly as normal. Yes, the 3D the debate. What can I say about it? You, you are Now, you've mentioned 3D TV in Britain, and Britain is not the highest commodity um, for this subject because... 3D died because of the two other biggest areas, which is China and Japan and America. Now, those have got much bigger population and TV had reached high definition and the cinemas needed something to push people back in, something closer to the action. They'd already dabbled in 3D many times in the cinema. Um, I remember going in and putting those red and uh, blue glasses on to watch um, House of Wax with Vincent Price and a number of other attempts. Jaws 3D comes to mind. Um, and with the release of Avatar um, and James Cameron adopting that, it seemed to open the floodgates. And what you have to understand here is, is that cinema were battling theatres and TV, and they have done for a long time. So, of course, TV had to fight back by saying, if you start releasing your media in 3D in cinemas, and we don't have a product that you can display that at home, we've lost something. So... 3D TV started to make an appearance. And I think calling it a failure is a hardship, really. It was pushing the technology envelope quickly where the technology just isn't there. The one thing, and I've mentioned this to Mainmeister in a number of waffles and a number of chats, is that we're a lazy bunch of gits. And I have to say that because... We don't want to sit, we don't want to do anything other than put a disc in, and even that is a hassle. Put the telly on, switch it on, and watch. Now, in the Nintendo gaming world, um, they struggled with 3D. They had the Virtu Virtua Boy, and then they brought out the 3DS. And they worked, they, they recognized that 
Nobody wants to put big things on their faces. They want to look down and have 3D. And they invented a display. But the trouble is the display, just like anything, can cause all sorts of problems with your eyesight, um, headaches, that sort of thing. But the other thing is, when you're looking at those displays, you have to look straight on. If most people that are watching a film these days are watching it with their loved one, or watching it with their parents, watching with four or five people. And that means that you're not always directly in front, you're sometimes sitting slightly to the right or the left, all the way round to the further extremes. And if anybody knows about technology, we'll tell you that OLED and LEDs have come along to really quite good angles, plasma being, I think, the best. Um, but... How do you do that in 3D if Nintendo can't do it with a handheld that's right in front of your face? So the technology moved quite quickly into putting polarized glasses on, and there were two types, active and passive. Um, the active ones were powered, um, and you had two independent frames going to your left eye and your right eye, and then merged into the one image your eye is tricked into thinking that there's one image and that works but you've got to remember to put your telly into 3d mode switch your glasses on everybody's got their glasses on then looking at the screen and you get an okayish result um but with these glasses and active glasses with HD, it halves the resolution. So, not only are you not watching it now in 1080p high definition, you've halved that resolution, you're now wearing glasses, these glasses are polarized, and that means that the image is darker, and you're, you're forever fighting against black darkness. Now, the other way which is what the cinema objective which is passive is polarized lenses and those work as well much better probably for you because there's no switching on and all that sort of stuff um, but those are even darker still you'll tend to find the active ones are slightly lighter um, so you've got a problem in the fact that we're a lazy load of rub um, gits sometimes batteries are there wearing glasses, all sorts of stuff. And many people saw that the prices of the 3D versions of the films were quite expensive as well, an extra fiver most of the time. Um, and in the early days, it was, you choose, do you want the 3D one or the Blu-ray one, right? And then later on, they looked at it and went, look, if you pay an extra fiver, we'll give you the 3D version and the Blu-ray will be free, okay? And you can still buy the Blu-ray by itself. So all I'm trying to say here is that after six years of that, and then as we moved forward with game technology and the new consoles were just about to come out, 4K hit us. <laughs> now, unless you can actually get a system that works where you don't wear glasses, then, of course, you've still got the cumbersome putting the TV into a certain mode and putting the glasses on. 4K brought us back round to the days of when HD was starting, where you just turned it on, 4K, yay ultra high hd and because we're lazy great and 3d became a thing of the past now it's a shame i used to like 3d and i still got tons and tons of 3d films just excuse me a minute but being as the cinema we're now doing less and less 3d presentations and most people were going back to watching the normal way 3d died and it slowly died in 
Japan, but in America it dived very quickly. <coughs> Britain then just follows suit. So as 4K came out, and because 4K uh, is something that's not adaptive in 3D technology, they took the 3D part out of the TVs, and we move forward now with mixes and matches of OLED and LED, uh, LCD, um, and I think even plasma now is very difficult to get TV-wise. haven't really looked at that for a while. But you have to look at it from this point of view. It was it was not a gimmick. It definitely was supposed to bring you closer to being in the screen, and it did its job. But the technology was brought in very, very quickly, and they didn't work on putting the revenue, the, the extra cash for buying physical media and the income coming from the cinema into developing that technology even more, which is why it's such a slow process of increased gain on VR. Same thing. If you don't pick it up, if you don't put the money in, if you don't put the development in, you don't come to the V2 VR, the V3 VR, the V4 VR, and so forth. Um, so, um, we are always at a crossroads when it comes to technology. We'll see how that goes. But uh, I'm glad I answered that question for you. Now, you said that there were two. So, excuse me again while I look for my next walking one. And I'll see if I can find you in there, Doug. Yep, found you. You said, nice one, Dell. Love these. Always looking forward to a new one appearing. That's the walking videos. Yeah, thank you. Questions for Sunday's blog. Now, I will say this, Doug. If it's possible, put the question for the blog in the blog. <laughs> so I don't have to keep missing it. Um, but honestly, this was just a mistake. I forgot to basically... I mentioned your name, I'm sure, in the blog, and then forgot to move the question over. So I my my humblest apologies to you. But you've got uh, questions for the Sunday blog. <clears throat> one, I left one in the last waffle, didn't get answered. Check it out. Yep, answered that. Two, ever fancied doing one of these walking holidays where you stay in a guest house for a couple of days, then walk to the next stop along the route, stay there a couple of days etc i've heard they can be great especially along a nice coastal route say cornwall for example now i will answer that and at the moment the answer is no but it's also a yes i thought about those for a long time and in fact they're very much a walking version of driving holidays which i did a lot in the states i would drive to a particular place book into a cheap motel do an awful lot of walking, go to my next step of my driving holiday after spending a couple of days and re rinse and repeat. And those were great because I was by myself and my mother and father were both around and with my father, you know, now left us, my mother needs to be involved and she couldn't do the walking. So I tend to find that I'm looking at holidays at the moment to take my mother on because she hasn't been on one for a while. And my dad used to take her on coach holidays, you know, where they'd go to Prestatin or they'd go to Bournemouth or they'd go to Blackpool and then spend a couple of days, go out for some meals, go along for a walk, take in the beach, have a chip supper, that sort of thing, that somebody in there like... 50th wedding anniversary would do S move on six years and my mother is now in her 80s and it's difficult for her to even walk in the garden um, she keeps threatening that she's going to learn to drive to get her out of the house she keeps threatening that she's going to go to Sainsbury's because I won't buy her a bottle of wine every day all sorts of stuff like that. And I know that my mother would have to walk round the block four times 
just to be able to walk to our Sainsbury's, go to the first checkout and then walk back. And the walk back would be a slight hill. So if my mother can't walk round the block four times, she can't walk to Sainsbury's. There's no way. But she's adamant. You don't get me my wine. I'm going to walk there and get it. <laughs> so I'm sort of blackmailed in a fun way. Going back to your question, though, it's a lovely question. It's something I have thought about. It's something that I will do. But right now, it's concentrate on my mum, concentrate on my health, concentrate a little bit on getting back to work and extend into doing these things in a hope that I don't miss the boat on the early part of my life, which could quite easily happen the longer that my mother lives. And, as lo and long may my mother live. I don't care. If I do that in my 60s, great. Um, you know, and I miss my 50s. Um, it's a sacrifice and it's one I'm easy to take. But my mother couldn't take it. But I think she'd like the coach holiday idea, you know, take her, go to a hotel, have her sort of like waited on, go to a spa, have a massage or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. Do something a bit different out of the norm. So I'm looking into that. So I hope that answers that question, Doug. And like I say, I do apologise um, wholeheartedly um in regards to missing your questions um i'm now going to move on to denny who i missed last week but i'm going to answer his topic at the end because it's rather a big one but i always like to read out denny's comments if i can find it there it is hi dale hope your mother and you are keeping well no laughing matter when the chemists mess up your prescription when you need it for what's essentially a substance that keeps your body functioning. Our chemist is absolutely awful at f fulfilling prescriptions. Half the time they lose them or they are too busy gassing amongst themselves and spend over half an hour in the shop waiting. New blood pressure meds for the next four weeks on top of the ones I'm already taking, having problems getting it down. Totally agree. I go into my prescription, which is built into my doctor's, and I fill in the repeat prescription online, and it says don't even try to attempt for seven days. In fact, give us your mobile number, and we'll text you when it's ready. Now, I've waited 10 days, and nothing's come through. So that text system doesn't work for a start. And then, when you get the texting out of the way, and you decide, right, eight days has happened, I'm going to go down. There'll always be something that's out of stock. Oh, we owe you 36 tablets because we've run out is a little sticker. You'll have to come down and get those. Um, and they don't think that you've got a life, that you've, you, you care for somebody else, that coming down to get 36 tablets would mean after those 36 tablets have gone, I've got to come to get another repeat prescription. And it's ad infinitum, rinse and repeat all over again. Totally terrible. And I won't even go into the, prescri the, the prescribing of these medicines because I do believe I'm on the wrong medicine. Um, even after all of that tried and tested part of a year, um, half my tiredness might be from the drugs but they assure me it's not um so we'll see nice to hear your comments of one of your heroes john Romita. always sad when uh one who you admire passes in a way i feel the same about the network group nothing can replace the original yes yeah, so we've had a couple of heartaches both of us network is a company that used to bring out the itv stuff from the past and they started to upscale them to blu-rays because a lot of these tv shows now are approaching the 50 year mark and above um so they're we've had them on dvd they're now moving to blu-ray and then they started to introduce as well stuff they have never released with the network company going into liquidation 
stocks of those products are now dwindling and there's nothing new coming out. And we were both expecting to have Sapphire and Steel and amongst another of TV shows get a Blu-ray pressing. In fact, um, it was Denny that informed me um, that the guy that was assembling the disc has hinted it's just around the corner. And now it's not just around the corner. We hope, as anybody who is a collector, that somebody buys Network or the stock or ITV renegotiate with someone with more money. But it seems very much that liquidation means that there were big debts, so nobody will pick up that brand name. Because they'll have to buy the debts off of them. So, yeah, difficulty. In my one, John Reminder, I've said enough. Um, but every day, you know, I, 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 in the last two weeks, I thought about John Romita and it, as, as the days go on, I think less and less, but every time I pick up a comic, I'll be, I'll be remembering John Romita and that's a good thing because he left a legacy. And as a number of people have said to me, your mother is very wise with that word legacy because you can enjoy everything he ever did and you've got it in your hands. So that's great. And I look at that and that's my um, good point on that. Um, you may, you carry on. My favourite Blackadder has to be Series 2. The writing and flow of the production was fantastic. Tom Baker's You Have a Woman's Hand. You, I thought you were going to put bottom there. Lots of like as for the end of Blackadder series four, for me it had a Blake Seven style ending, one nobody could forget. Yes. Um this was a time where that question was coming out where Blackadder's fortieth anniversary had come up and they found the lost pilot. And Gold has, has done a little documentary and broadcast for the first time the lost pilot. And it started a whole what series is the best series the first one the second one the third one and the fourth one and i think it's commonly known that the second and the fourth ones were the best but there's some people that will say fourth first second second and other people will say second first fourth second you know like that um i love them all don't get me wrong um i do think the quality was slightly better in the fourth one. But then they'd been writing Blackadder for quite some time by that point. And of course, the production values were always quite high anyway. And I think there's a lot of more people that would recognise World War One than they would Victorian, Elizabethan, sorry, should I say, England. Let me just take a sip. So I have to say, four and two for me, but I tell you what, it's darn close. Never really got on with the third one too much either. So I hope I've got caught up now so we get to this week because we're 40 minutes in and I ain't started. So <laughs> that'll teach me, won't it? So I'm changing now my view to um, the stuff this week. And I'm going to read them out in the order that I see there. There are no filters on. Hopefully I'm not going to miss anything. And we get to Denny. Funnily enough. Right at the top. <coughs> and he says, Hey, you mate. Enjoyed our little chat again on Friday. Never short of a subject to talk about, are we? No, we're not. And I have to say, Denny did give me a call on Friday, as did Main Meister. Cheered me up no end. Um, I was having a bad couple of days. They wouldn't have known that. Um, and I chewed the cud with Denny for about two hours. Um, and I had a nice sort of, although brief, talk with May Meister. We got all of the stuff out of the way. What's going on with you? What's going on with me? Where are you going? Where am I going? What's happening this weekend? We got all that. You know, which is great. Because it's always nice to just be out of the blue, you know. 
sleep apnea yes um so you mentioned how you pronounce it the thing about it was is that when i was pronouncing it and this happens an awful lot i will go off on a tangent and start bringing in something without thinking about do i know enough about the pronunciation of the subject i'm about to talk about yeah like I don't usually write down the word phlegm, say. So when somebody mentions the word phlegm and they've done it in writing format, I go, oh, that's, what's that? Oh, right, I understand where you're talking about now. And when it comes to my sleep problems, I sort of knew the word but couldn't sort of pronounce it at the time. It's one of those sort of things. Of course, it's apnea. But at the time... I wasn't prepared to even talk about it. It was just one of them tangent things. So do bear with me, guys, a little bit. Read between the lines sometimes a little bit. Um, the one thing I don't want to portray is me being thick. You know what I mean? I don't... I already have a low confidence about myself. But I do know I'm intelligent. You know, I didn't get to where I... Be. Oh, now I'm going to start like Reggie Perrin here. I didn't get to where I was today without, you know, knowing a few things. <laughs> anyway, he says, he continues, I would say Monopoly is my favourite board game. A new story from our area is the Black Panther made a phone call from one of the old red phone boxes just three streets from uh, uh, up from us. Wow. Yeah, that is news. Wow, Black Panther as well. Um, a shame about the actor that played him dying of cancer. Um, but hey, yeah. Favourite carry-on movie has to be carry-on screaming. Now, before I go down the route of now, I should have a... A rapport or a reprise myself for that particular um, statement it's hard for me to give a favorite with carry on films because there's a glut of them that i like they're all good there isn't one bad one until you get to what they call the distant cousin of the carry on films which is carry on columbus which is awful don't get me wrong. But everybody has a favourite and everybody will come up and say, you know, screaming, camping, um, cabbie, Cleo, put carry on in front of all of these. Again, doctor, nurse, you know, spying. You know, so many. I mean, you, there's 20 on. So what you have to understand here is is there's bits and bobs in all of them, but when it comes to the 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 whole bulk of the film, there's 98% I really love in this film. There's a couple of them. Screaming is one. Um, I hate to think, really, how Screaming would have turned out if Sid James had been available. Because Harry, Harry Corbett did such a great job. But he was there because Sid James wasn't available. Um, Cabbie is a black and white one, but you shouldn't knock a black and white film. It's the script that's great. And that one is brilliant. Um, I like things like uh, Carry On Camping, Carry On Dick, um, Different Reasons. Um, they got a little bit saucier towards the end probably too much in that direction too much insistence to show a nipple here and there on a woman you know what I mean you don't need that the early days it was just seeing the side boob was enough you know if we're talking sexist stuff here a little bit um, but it's seaside humour you know um, there were times where um, the worm that turned occur. I remember that Barbara Windsor pulled down uh, Peter Butterworth's trousers in the um, in a lift in Carry On Loving, was it? No, um, 
was the one by the seaside where there was a beauty contest going on. Oh, it'll come to me. But what I'm saying is Barbara Windsor was a feisty character, somebody that wouldn't accept sexist stuff. She just knew what she wanted, went for it. Um, and that's unusual in a 70s uh, comedy. So anyway, we'll move on from that. LFC came up uh, with a use of grammar that rubs you up the wrong way question. Not grammar, but I hate the way we spell center. It should be center. Oh, so I can't really show this. Center. Probably watching Journey to the Center of the Earth too many times. Yeah. It's the way we spell things that's awkward, I think, for our American cousins. You know, with color being a perfect example with ours having O-U-R and theirs having O-R and all sorts of stuff. But we naturally want to spell it a certain way because of the way that we pronounce it, you know? So, yeah, I can totally understand that. Um, like yourself, I'm enjoying Seb's 8-bit battle. Robocop, great little series of videos. And, yes, it's nice. I think this 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 sort of like um, reaffirms what I'm trying to do, which is I'll mention what I've been branching out and watching on YouTube in a hope that maybe you'll then watch those and maybe there'll be something in there that you like. Now, I came across Seb's channel a couple of weeks ago. Didn't know quite what to make of it at first. He came. A, there was a video that came out of his where he was doing a battle which I then brought to your attention. Uh, but the subsequent videos, more in agreement with. And Denny saw this, went to see something that I did, liked it, and basically is now watching that more often. And that's how our channels grow. Um, so I'm finding it harder sometimes to find newer stuff to watch because... I'm watching more of your guys' output, and that takes up quite a bit of time. And then with the telly stuff that I need to watch as well, because I do need to watch something that's high-end. Um, I don't have the time, you know, to, to suddenly branch out and look a bit more. But as long as YouTube keeps saying, we think you might like this, and as much as I, I'm always researching... So I'm typing in things. I will come across the odd gem. And when I come across the odd gem, I'll mention it. And it will be with you guys. Um, now, the one thing that I'm going to mention last for in Denny's comments is just because he's recommended a TV show several weeks now. I've read it out. I haven't got around to watching it myself. And... He likes it so much that he mentions it every week. So I'm going to mention it again, and I will get round to watching it. He says, this week on Tenny, telly, I finished watching Silo on Apple TV. This has to be the best new series for sci-fi fans. Great ending on episode 10. Guys, it's a must watch. So I've mentioned it again, Denny. I will write this down. I will, at the end of this blog, write things down. And I will get to that. And thank you so much for bringing things like that to my attention. And the, and the fact that you like the collector's demonstration of my movie and comic collection. Um, because, again, we all use different programs. We all use different methods to do things that we do as a similar thing in our hobby. And if I can say, look, I'm not an endorser of this, but this is what I use, and I've used it for 10 plus years, that's got to be something that says, well, if he does it that way, it must be good. And then you can reciprocate by saying, I use this, have you tried this? And I then learn something new. And then we all have an opinion about something because we've tried both ways. And we can choose the one on whether we stick with what we know or we move on to something new. So please, if you've got a piece of software that you use, if there's a piece of hardware that you use, if there's something, a website 
where you think this I think I should mention to you because I think you'll get major enjoyment out of it or if you do it this way it's easier please do so that's that's what all that we've ever wanted is we don't want people to go I know something that you don't and I'm going to keep it to myself because it's what keeps me ahead of the game because we've had that in people at work and you're only as strong as the weakest member of your team. And therefore, if you think you're making yourself recession-proof by keeping knowledge, you're doing everybody a disservice. Tell us. Tell us how it works. Give us th that knowledge, right? And it's the same with just in a friendly way, <clears throat> telling us how you maintain your hobby. So we move on and we get to Steve's Gaming. We love Steve. There's my salute to you, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Though, love Steve to death. You know, he's one of my um, favourite people I chat to. Um, and we have a lot in common. And um, we started sort of at the same time doing blogs and our channels. Um, and rightfully, he moved on much faster pace than me i'm always the turtle of compared to the hare but it's now it's neither here nor there on that um he he says um i doubt good one um thanks for answering my question and i have a new one for you i'm going to try and get you thinking do you, <laughs> if you do then you've be, beaten all the teachers um, did you have any of these crafting toys in the 70s? Plastic craft, shaker maker, paint wheels, enamel craft, chemistry set. And if so, did you have fun with any of them? Take care and love to your mum. Oh, and by the way, my fave carry on film are regardless, cabby cruising and convenience sid james is great in all four yeah it's great everybody has an opinion on carry on thank you so much for telling me about yours uh cabby what a film um so underrated um anyway you have a crafting question for me and it's funny i was thinking about this the other day when i just quickly looked at it and i went why does shaker maker ring a bell with me and I think I remember rightly, it was one of those ones where you had a canister that was in two parts. You put the ingredients in, you locked it tight, and then you shook it. And then you left it to settle, like some sort of like plaster of Paris thing. And then you unhook the two halves, and you'd have your plus, you know, you'd have your shaker maker model. All done. I'm pretty sure that's Shaker Maker. Uh, plastic enamel, enamel craft my sister had. She definitely had these badges where you used enamel paint and you put it in and it gave you a sort of like a 3D badge or made out of enamel paint. She did things like beetle brooches and things. I remember that. I had many chemistry sets. You know, like uh, I had things like the 3D human body and chemistry sets where I had little test tubes and a. But it, they always wanted a Bunsen burner of some sort. Mother's wasn't very happy with that. And, but we had a gas stove. Um, but it was always what happens if you mix these two chemicals together? Oh, and by the way, make sure you've got plenty of cloth around when you mix these two together. You just went, all oh, right. This is going to foam up then, is it? Um, even at an early age, I knew that sort of thing was going to go on. But I've talked about my sort of like crafting background before. And I was always into the airfix kits, you know, building the eagle, building the um tanks and boats because of the pictures that they always had them by airfix airfix kits 
I then later moved on to Marvel kits beyond the plastic ones and turned into resin. And I started to cut resin away and glue them together and paint them and shade them. Um, they were lovely, but very expensive. Um, next tier of crafting, that was. But back in the day, it was everything, wasn't it? We had Etch-A-Sketch. <laughs> Try drawing with two two paddles <laughs> that turned it up X and Y axes. Uh, just because it had sand and a magnet in it. <laughs> People that drew stuff in there, I just don't know how they did it. They got ma masses of patience, masses of, of creativity. I couldn't do anything more than a gun with it. Um, etch a sketch. I remember there was, a, I can't remember the name of it. It'll probably come to me. Um, it was a tracing trace or something oh it was a um, it was like a boom arm on a mic um an elongated piece of plastic with a tracer pen at one side and a pen at the other and you got your comic and you trace the outline and the pen the other end would draw it for you exactly as you were tracing and he'd do it and if you changed the apex of the, where the brackets were, you could enlarge it even. Um, so you learned a little bit about maths with that thing as well. Um, oh, what was it called? Trace. Et no, it'll come to me. You'll know it instantly, and I'm pretty sure you'll put it down just to prove that you know more than me, you git. Uh, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've explained it very well. And then I had Spirograph. I think we all had Spirograph. Put the little pins on the pieces of plastic cogs. Get a smaller cog with holes in. Um, and put your pen in and, and reel the cog around. Round and round and round it would go. And you'd have a lovely um, spiralating pattern. That you could build. That could be the building blocks of something that you were going to draw. Pins would move though, wouldn't they? Bastard thing. Um... I think we all had that spirograph. So I'm going to end it there by saying I don't remember all of the things you said. Paint wheels, no. Um, and I think I had plastic craft. But I was more into the Play Doh, Airfix kits, drawing stuff than I was anything else but the biggest one that i was into after airfix kit so it's the second one was plaster of paris molds where i would you'd buy a box set of molds that had your favorite characters like marvel characters or dc characters or film characters or cartoon characters and you mix plaster of paris with water you poured the concoction into the rubber molds you had them balanced by two sticks generally or inside a container so that it was upside down. Leave it overnight, peel the rubber off and paint the plaster of Paris figurine. Great days. The moulds are now so brittle that I don't think anybody can sell them even on eBay. I've got a couple of them, but I can't find the Marvel ones anymore. The closest thing you'll get now is jelly molds or um, cake molds of Spider-Man stuff. You will not find a plaster and Paris mold of Spider-Man that I can find anyway. And I, it's been a while since I looked, but I'm pretty sure I'm right with that. And I hope that's answered your question. My salute to you, sir. Thank you so much. Then we got Playtendo guy who... Um, I watch his channel of he's got hey another quality blog mate hope you're well so just a nice little comment from him thank you so much playtendo guy um love your stuff um i do like the movie talks it gets me thinking about some of the tv and films i've watched over the years uh, i hope you get enjoyment of my later part of my blogs where i do not an unboxing but i show bits of what i bought this week um I can only imagine that's probably the bit that you'll concentrate on on my blog. 
but uh thanks anyway for being here then we got seb who we talked about earlier seb is has started to watch and written a question i think great vlog as usual on the back of talking about owning an x arcade controller yes because my x arcade is just here um in your own main cabinet you've got um your arcade games what you want to know what my favorite trackball game is because of my XRK as a trackball um, and your main cabinet doesn't. And the thing about MAME is, is the trackball is something where you can use a mouse or the trackball or a paddle for anything that says analog controls. And it's amazing how many digital games have some type of analog device that you can use as well as a digital device outruns perfect um it has a steering wheel but it has an analog and a digital interface so that you can actually play it on a controller and so from that point of view even games like outrun are great if you can configure them right with a trackball you've got incremental control with the trackball so you can move it left and right and that will be the steering of going left and right and you can roll it i mean obviously the games the go-to games um for me um is missile command i'll always play missile command with a trackball but the other one that i like to go back to with a trackball is centipede and millipede you can play it with a digital joystick and it works perfectly fine. But the game was originally intended for a trackball. And trying to play it with a trackball is a great experience. Because I think most people's remembrance of Centipede and Millipede really is not the arcade, but the home versions. I remember the Crystal Castles was a trackball game. But I was never into that game. It was the only thing I liked about it was the way it drew the 3D castle. From then on, Bentley Bear is it his name? Never really liked that. And I wasn't really into American football, but I do remember playing basketball with a trackball. I think Atari did a range of those. And then of course we come to the golf games. Now, most of the golf games that I saw in the arcade were mostly Neo Geo, and they didn't really use trackballs. But I have used trackballs in golf games as well. And the last time I tried to play Tempest with a trackball, it failed. Oh, it failed big time. But I think if you can persevere, you can get the trackball to work with Tempest, and I believe it works quite well. Of course, with that, you really want to use a spinner. And there's no better person than I can think of other than Ponder, who if you if he if he, he comments to you, then it's great. The spinner is so important for that game. You know? So I think I've mentioned a couple of games there. If I had a main arcade game, I don't think there's any way that you could not have Outrun, Millipede, Centipede. Um, a missile command out of your main cabinet they are two quintessentially iconic games to not have them there and of course they take up very little time little space because they're so small um, because of the era that they came out of but i think i've mentioned enough there i think there's probably a couple of others i think there's some dark games that worked with a trackball bowling games definitely sorry about that um and hopefully that's sort of like giving you an answer and thanks so much for your question seb um brilliant um paul patrick says dell do you have a projector to watch your movie collection on ust projectors with alr folding screens look quite practical and easy to set up yes it's amazing but for a huge amount of time, projectors was going to be the way I was going to go. Now, I was umming and ahhing, even at the days of DVD, 
whether my next TV was going to be the next was going to be the Philips 32 inch again, you know, but the newer model. Or whether I was going to go with an overhead projector. And I looked at the projectors and the installation and thought, no, I'm never going to be able to get this right. And I didn't fancy having a projector on a table pointing at a drop down sheet. Because we're talking 1999, 2000. Now, I've got a couple of projectors, but the projectors I've got are more for slideshows for that would be used in the office when you're trying to do a demonstration of something, you know, and you've got your your Adobe, sorry, your um, PowerPoint show ready to go. Not really made for film, you know, 24 frames per second, proper uh, luminance lens and lamp etc etc so i haven't thought about it again because i'm i've got the trappings of this room if i just go to my uh galaxy note cam here you'll see that it's long as it is and it's very short wide okay so where well, the projector wouldn't work um, where the light is above my TV there, just there, look. It's, the image needs to be further away to get the image that you'd want. And I'd rather have the setup I've got at the moment while my mother's alive, you know, while this house is not mine. And have it that way than to buy into a projector system that wouldn't really work until later on when I convert a room into a cinema type environment. So I hope that answers your question. It's an interesting question, but you definitely need the room to do it in. And projectors are now so lovely. There are 4K projectors, HD projectors, um, and they can be as small as you want as well. Um, and the only thing you have to worry about is the bulb. At the end of the day and those are easy to um, replace so yeah definitely something i think other people should think about we'll, we'll go back now to the camera view and move on thank you very much for your question paul milfy oh here we go the questions that sometimes i dread but hey maybe i won't this time we'll have a look um questions for your next bloggers Milfi is brilliant. Thank you, Milfi. You know you've got my eternal thanks. With people wanting new sports put into the Olympics and such, talk of snooker and darts and golf, etc. Why not add video games? So my question this week comes in two parts. Firstly, would you like to see video games in the Olympics? And secondly, if you had to pick the games for the competition which say three or more games would you pick right okay i am actually quite strong-minded in this instance and i think it would be a terrible idea to have video games in the olympics call me an old fuddy-duddy you're an old fuddy-duddy um but the olympics was supposed to be a show of skill and strength endurance determination and where video games have parts of those things it doesn't have them all okay in my opinion always remember in my opinion we do have video game events and those work quite well and they're money or orientated okay and they work with first person shooters and generally real-time strategy games okay but the reason i don't think i want them at the olympics is pretty much like i've just said i always consider the olympics to be like the open day at school where you had the school sports day where all the kiddies would be doing the 200 the 400 the 100 meters chucking the javelin the shot put the long jump the high jump a skill with a bit of energy about it yeah having the olympics with decathlon in 
where the only thing you're doing is waggling a joystick or getting the right angle because you press the button has part of those things, but not all. You see what I'm getting at? So, and sometimes you got to remember that you'd have to you'd have to look at the code to make it equal. Um, there will be a sweet spot in the game, say 35 degrees at the angle. All, all you're asking there for an Olympic champion to do is to be able to, at the same time as wag or something, hit a button at a certain length of time to get the 35 angle. Now, if both of you are sort of like quite neck and neck with your competency in this, you could be there for five days. Every time running up, getting the 35. How boring would that be to watch? And... Yeah, I just, I just don't. I something about it makes me go, no, it's wrong for so many reasons. You want free games, though. I suppose I'd have to think about something along the lines of Tetris because it's arcadey, makes your brain think, and if you put the if you ramp the speed up you basically are definitely giving yourself a bit of a workout for both brain and hand-to-eye coordination. Decathlon definite, that's because of all of the endurance with waggling and the accuracy of getting the angles. But you see, most of the games that we played in video are already there, like uh, darts and snooker and pool and billiards. And we have some of those events already as sports so yeah it's a difficult one i'd have trouble with the third one but it'll probably be some sort of shooter like gallagher because again it's hand eye coordination with the speed ramped up to give you that great you're an olympic champion type thing you know I wouldn't see a text adventure, say, in the Olympics. You know what I mean? Although you could turn around and say, get out of that, finish this finish this adventure in under a day <laughs> and see whether what the percentage is. That's about it, really. I hope that answers your question, Milvi. A very interesting one. I think a lot of people will have their own opinion of it. Please, if you do, write your comments. Um... I just don't see video games in the Olympics at all. I'm sorry, that's my that's my final shout out with that one. LFC Gamer and Vlogs. Cheers for another cracking blog, Dell. Um, even though I've been supporting Liverpool since the late nineties, I'll happily view a random match from the lower leagues, which despite not making as much money as your Arsenal's, they provide just as much, if not more, determination than a typical Premier League game. Even some of the European clubs like AC Milan uh, and Borussia Dortmund, is that right? International games on the other side. I'll only bother with those if it's the World Cup or the Euro qualifiers, and especially friendlies bore the absolute tits off me. <laughs> Notice I don't censor what you put <laughs> guys my question for the next blog um what are some of your favorite pieces of early commodore 64 game music you like around the 1982-84 i.e aztec challenge frantic freddy lazy jones super pipeline and just a few that spring to mind so you're talking pre-hubbard And I have to say, there were a couple of catchy tunes the Vic-20 had, but the Vic-20 was more, for me, sound effects. You know, the arcade sound effect noise. But it had tunes like Radar Rat Race and so forth. Um, it even had the Hall of the Mountain King in, in the Mountain King game that I did in my 8 Bits challenge. When it comes to Commodore 64, I was impressed with Ghostbusters. Not just because of the speech, but I thought, hey, that tune's not bad. They've done a pretty good job there. 
The one that really impressed me the most was Wheeling Wally, um, a classical piece of music in there, and Revenge of the Mutant Camels, Pete's piece of um, Mozart, I think, in there. Again, classical piece. You've mentioned the ones... You see, the problem with this is you mentioned the ones that also would be there for me. Super Pipeline. Super Pipeline 2. Lazy Jones would be there. Um, a lot of Task Set games had some really catchy tunes in them, to be quite honest. Um, Trolley Wally, which had all of those lovely jar tunes in them. Um, but I think... Wheeling Wally, that first piece of music with the letters coming on at the beginning, it sticks out to me, probably because at the time there was very little around it. And I loved all the glowing letters, but that music, it made me want to go and find out what piece of music that was, then listen to what that piece of music um, was in real world instruments, um, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that's answered your question. Now, the next one. If you were to visit your local chippy, do you prefer having curry or gravy on your chips? Do you know what? I'm going to answer that with a very unpopular answer. Neither. Chips must have sauce on it or a dip of some sort, so curry could be there, or barbecue. But for me, if I'm going to put anything over the top of it, it's baked beans. Oh, the baked bean sauce. If I pour that over chips, I'm in heaven, right? And I, anybody that knows me like knows... Now, I'm going to sound a bit northern here, because for months and years and years and years, I used to call them chip butties, or a chip roll, but it's in the north, it's a chip balm. Balm cakes. You'd have heard of it, balm cakes. So I, I, I got into that bit of calling them chip balms. But you do that with beans in it, and you got, and as long as it doesn't soggy the bread, baked beans with chips in a, in a, in a balm cake. Oh, yeah. I'm hungry now, you sod. You said you weren't going to open up Food Gate, bastard. <laughs> no, thanks very much. And I hope that's answered your question for you, uh, LFC. David, retro games play badly. Thank you so much for continuing your support, David. I love your channel. Brilliant. Uh, are any of us truly comfortable in our bodies, mate? Question mark. Yes. And I can understand that statement, but some of us are more conscientious than than others there are people that i look at them and i go what are you worried about you haven't got the worries like i've got being fat you know what i mean and i'm a very what i call a person that uses empathy an awful lot i'm very empathic so i recognize when somebody says oh my nose looks crooked or it looks like it's been punched in the face 50 million times etc or i'm too short or you know whatever but fat has a lot of problems. It can, when you're going through puberty, say, the fat can be so ingrow, you know, so over the top that it makes everything else look smaller. So let's talk about the the elephant in the room um, for a male, the penis, right? If you're fat makes it look smaller what does the one thing that a bloke turns around and turns around and say a bit is very conscientious about how big your dick is right so i was picked on at school was overweight my dick is normal size but because of um flab and fat around it which basically raises the skin out and therefore takes an inch or so away Hey, the presto, you got a small dick. So you not only have you got a problem with your weight, you got a, somebody turning around and saying, you're no man either. And women have had this all the time. I've heard lots of conversations saying, 
it's size doesn't matter, but women have always turned around and had problems with their boobs or whether their private parts are too big, too small, stick out, whatever. You don't need that in your life. So when somebody is the right height, six foot, five, five eleven, right? Six foot. Um, black hair, no problem with their facial features. The right body weight, but not chiselled. you got to turn around and go, you don't know what a problem is. Do you see what I'm getting at? Your teeth can be corrected. Your, all sorts of things can be corrected. Right? But it's very difficult with fat because of comfort eating. You go away, you feel worse about yourself. What's the first thing you do? You go home, eat a piece of cake or a sandwich or something that's fatty or a packet of crisp back then when you were a child. Now, less so. But what I'm trying to get at is, is there are times of boredom that you eat because of boredom. I The, the one thing a, a dietitian said to me once is, it takes 20, 20 to 30 minutes for your brain to recognize you've eaten something. So chew your dinner as much as possible. Try this. And if you, it, this is probably something that everybody knows, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, if you chew your meal more and you eat it, by the time you get to 20 minutes and your dinner is still, I don't know, two thirds, you know, a third there, you'll start to fill up. That's why you don't need your pudding. And I tend to find that this is true because if anybody goes to a restaurant and they go with their loved one and they're talking at the table towards each other saying, oh, isn't this steak lovely, my lovely? I hope you're enjoying your your uh, your lovely um, pasta dish that you've got there. And, you know, oh, was this salad's lovely? Should we go to the salad bar? And all of this sort of stuff. You will tend to find that you eat slower in a restaurant and you fill up quicker. Amazing. It's just your brain needs to recognize it. So if you eat a packet of crisps and you just go into your gob, right? Then basically your brain hasn't caught up yet that you've even eaten anything. So you go, cool, that packet of crisps didn't fill me. I'll go and have another packet of crisps. See what I mean? Anyway, um, you carry on. My nose is too big. My chin is weak. <laughs> no, it's not, mate. I've looked at you. You're just ugly. No, of course you're not. <laughs> you're great, mate. Look, everybody loves your channel, and um, you're you you're, you're on video. You're showing your stuff. I can't see anything wrong with you. I've learned as I've got older to be happy with the skin I'm in. Thank God for that. So maybe you took what I've just said as a bit of a joke. Hopefully. As ever, you're keeping me company at work. I'm glad I do that every week. Uses. Oh, used to love. I think it's supposed to be what used to do there. Used to love mapping games. Nomad. Uh, Elf. Eye of the Beholder. Yeah, didn't we all? I got a bit. I tended to find I could map out an, an adventure, text adventure game more than I could these platform games. Don't know what it is. I think it's because especially in a game where you go through a door and you think you're going to be in the courtyard and it shows you another door in your head you're thinking you've just gone through the door and you've entered another room it's when it goes off into a tangent and you're actually now on the other side of a castle that i go how am i supposed to map this because i can't get spatial awareness right Do you know what i mean i'd suddenly have done a third of it and then found i've made a mistake because when i went through this door i actually went across to another part of the whole game you know, and it wasn't always that clear, especially with teleporters. Um, uh, all on graph paper, but sadly all gone. Gave the arc a go, was disappointed, to be honest. Yes, I was saying to you, matey, that this, when I got to episodes three and four, very formulatic. I'm going to watch it because, and I, I made this a point in the actual blog itself, Season two has been commissioned. And it's an interesting story on the problems they're going to have getting to where they've got to get to with so many problems going on. And there's an interesting set of characters that just don't like each other. 
right? So there's something there to keep me going. But to be quite honest, very formulatic. If you didn't watch it, you haven't missed anything. Do you see what I mean? It's very much that sort of thing. National Lampoons is a classic. I enjoyed Water Waterworld, but it's no Madman. No, it's not. Uh, I think you mean Mad Max. Thanks for the company, mate. No, my pleasure, matey. It's absolutely a pleasure speaking to you in this way. I hope at some point we're all going to meet. Um, and that will be brilliant if that occurs. You know, even if uh, we go to a convention or an event or whatever. Brilliant. Thanks very much, matey. Let me come to my salute to you. Come to Colin Jones. Ponder. Um... So he carries on with something where, yes, I know that my knowledge is not that great on this, but it's the sub that, that basically imploded wasn't actually expensive for the purpose. That was the issue. They took so many shortcuts, it's criminal. There are quite a few engineering videos on the topic, so I won't go into detail, but the management of this submersible had me infuriated. Yes, and I feel the same way, matey. Um... Deaths are terrible, but um, if you've got a substandard craft that you're taking people in every day, then, you know, I you, you should be banned. That's what I'm trying to get to. Um, I do publish a schedule for Twitch, but YouTube uploads tend to happen when they happen. The only exception is... I do try to get my vlog out on a Monday uh, of my long weekends. Yes, and I love those, matey. Um, and I do understand. This came about because I was saying that I'm getting later and later YouTube alerts, but Twitch I get hardly any. And I, even though I'm subscribed and I've hit the alert me when something's going on, if I miss something in Discord, then I've missed the whole caboodle. So... I would say YouTube is fairer than Twitch, but that's just my opinion based on my experience. Other people's will be different. Um, I miss simple TV guides. These days, they're small print indexes. Yes, we were talking about the fact that your electronic guide on your TV <coughs> is there. But at the end of the day, not particularly uh, great and I used to love looking at the radio times and TV times thanks very much Colin down the rabbit hole I was overjoyed to hear Putin uh, considers the Wagner rebellion as a stab in the back with luck dictators like him might learn uh, war is useless and can backfire totally agree with you matey here I was saying out loud one of my favourite board games was Mousetrap until you said how much you disliked it so I, I bit my tongue. Um, actually, it's really just assembling the whole apparatus that I enjoy. Never really played the game myself. Did you know that there's a mini version of Mousetrap? Search Gen X Grown Up because he's played it. I did know that there was a mini Mousetrap. The reason I didn't like Mousetrap was it was Tim Pot. There was always that bit where I was trying to assemble it and that cage, which was supposed to go down the little teeth, and judder it would f happen without me even touching the plastic you know um i did like the assembly part of it um but when you're playing the game you want the you want the, the mechanism to work and when it didn't work it was a such a anti-climax i think is the is the word thanks as always for the shout out my pleasure down the rabbit hole and if um, i haven't mentioned it already do go visit these people's channels. Absolutely fantastic, all of them. And we come to another one of my favourite channels, Robert's Retro Gaming. Yes. Hi, Dal. I'm glad to hear that the week went a bit better than the last three-day one. Regarding weight, it's something a lot of us struggle with, but I also think it's something we are overly concerned with. What really matters is what you can do and how you feel. Exercise as much as you can. Try to look after yourself and your health. And try not to be too concerned and what others might think about you. Yeah, and that's a good comment to make because 
I think the reason that doesn't work when you're younger is purely because it's in your face all the time and you're being reminded by cruel people that bully of just what they don't like about you, you know? So when it's in your face, when you don't like it yourself, you get into a tizzy. Anyway, Russia seems like it should be ripe for an internal movement to turn over the government, but I don't really know anything about what's going on politically other than uh, oppression and government propaganda. Propaganda, it's hard to know. Yes, I agree. I suspect that mystery symptom is pronounced phlegm. Yes, again, apologies for me on there. Hammer House of Horror looks like a bit much for me now never mind me of all these years ago <laughs> give it a go matey honestly please um the collection tracking software looks very comprehensive and interesting i tell you what if i given anybody a bit of advice on collecting and what software to use i hope that one came across loud and clear you've written a lot more than that um but i've conscious a little bit of time robert thank you so much for all of your comments um i think there was a fun one thank goodness milfie finally took you down a peg somebody needed to do it how dare you slag off rainbow islands there we are i got your ridicule note in so hopefully that makes up for the fact i didn't read out all of your comments but please guys all of you can look at the the text that's going on here and we get to Martroid. Cheers for this week's blog, Dal. Awesome as usual. Hey, I watched Rain Man um, the, the weekend. It was a big film of its time, but I can't say I ever remember seeing it back then. Very enjoyable. Yes, it was. Absolutely fantastic, um, Martroid. And it's one of those films where it's performance over story a little bit, really. Um, Dustin Hoffman's portrayal was is absolutely brilliant um probably more than tom cruise's and tom cruise's who's the brother who's got nothing wrong with him um he won the oscar if i remember rightly um you know it, it's one of those films a bit like forrest gump later on but it was brilliant where he could count those sticks. You know, I mean, I know it's only in the script, but it goes 10 times, 2,074 sticks, 2,074 sticks, like this, because um, he's aut autistic. Yeah, brilliant. Many memories of that. And just to say, Stevie Paperboy, thank you very much. All the best, Del Boy. All my best to you too. And that is the end of the questions. And oh my God, we're an hour and a half in and I haven't done anything yet. Okay, it's going to be a long one, fellas. So I do apologize for the length this week. Okay, so I'll try and go quickly. Uh, but I do want to say thanks to every single one of you for all of those questions. What I watched on YouTube, and as you know, there are certain some stale some stay points with this so i watched this week in retro which covered free subject this week uh, a truck converted into a dot matrix printer that was quite fun basically it'd probably be good for street writing on um but it was just a um uh, anomaly topic uh the ultimate easter egg it's always nice that people cover easter eggs because even now I'm having difficulty thinking what was the first Easter egg I saw or read about because most people will say adventure but I'm just wondering how many people actually discovered that at the time and they're actually thinking that they did discover it when actually they discovered it much later on than they remember. Um, I do remember playing adventure but I didn't play it long enough for me I think to find that anomaly or even to realize that it was an easter egg if i remember rightly i did see that weird line going down the screen thought nothing of it i thought it was something you can't go through and i wouldn't have even thought of it as being an easter egg until somebody pointed it out i wouldn't have probably have remembered that and then the last part of this week in retro was the apple II controlled lego v8 engine which is great nice um i think we've all done something at school in computer class where you control the drawing of a droid that's got a pen in it using 
logo or some language. Um, this one was controlling the internal combustion pistons of a Lego built V8 engine and having the Apple II control the timing. Great. Um, found much more interested in Tech Moan's channel rather than This Week in Retro, to be quite honest. Um, that's not to say that This Week in Retro wasn't quality, it's just that the subject matter this week didn't really engross me that much. Just check my other blogs the last two weeks where I've been fully engrossed. Love This Week in Retro. Tech Moan talked about the BBC TV transmitter breakdown tape now if you don't know what that is go do watch this channel but what tends to happen is is that back in the 60s and there's no video transmitters sometimes went to half power or broke down altogether and they had to have something that told the person that was trying to tune in the summit wrong right so there was lots of people manning transmitter stations that would flip a tape on and broadcast a transmission tape that says we've got a problem and we're working on it just like we have on tvs these days with the card that comes up and says we interrupt this program because we've got a problem uh, please listen to this music or this spinning cube or whatever while we work on the problem two minutes later your tv program is back on this was a 60s tape so basically it was in the early days of tv mostly used on anything that used a UHF or AM transmission from these transmission stations. That was great. <clears throat> uh, Stez Sticks did a, he fixed a golden T golf TV game, which I watched purely because it had a trackball and I thought it might have a trackball problem, but it didn't. It had a problem with power and a problem with um, showing the video. So I was a bit disappointed because I'd love to have seen the trap ball assembly taken to bits. Um, but it's still an interesting watch. Um, this week I watched Mad Commodore. He was playing some new and old Commodore 64 games. It was really nice to go back to Mad Commodore after a period of time where I haven't. That was brilliant. Um, definitely check out Mad Commodore's channel. Uh, Jordan Ash did a Blue Yeti X comparison uh, old versus new for a mic and I'll explain why you might recognize that or notice that the sound is a little bit better um, that's because I'm now using a new microphone and it's on a boom arm here you might see it better if I change to the Galaxy Note cam because it's just there on this boom arm I'll talk about that later on because that's something that um, I want to talk about some of my purchases and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we've got uh, on a retro tip. Now, get that right. On a retro tip. They did a making of the Day of the Tentacle 30th anniversary documentary. Now, I'm not a big person that's on the scum engine but i loved Samamax hit the roads full throttle but the most important one to me was day of the tentacle and i've shown that in when i was showing off my mister when it was showing how a pc could be actually done because i wanted to show you what midi sounded like um so that documentary was wonderful because there were so many leaps and bounds in quality of the animation, the picture, and the sound in that game. It's night and day on how far they move forward with the Scum Engine with Day of the Tentacle. So definitely watch that. Then there's a couple of uh, new friends of mine that I always give a shout out at because they have a week, a, a, a weekday or on a Wednesday movie chat done by Playtendo Guy. And on a Wednesday, I go in there and I start talking about old TV, horror, sci-fi, Marvel movies. And it's great. And it changes my brain slightly to something away from retro gaming, which is my first passion, really. You know, it's um, no word of a lie. Movies and games are very interwoven with me. But I would say that gaming is a slightly more than movies. But you wouldn't think about it. Um 
It's just movies was something that I loved to do with a group of people and gaming was something that I did by myself a little bit when we're talking about the 8-bit years and so forth. Your experience will be different to mine. So I watched that on Wednesday and was part of their chat in the, because I was in the chat room just writing some questions. But one of the panellists is called Rock God 2004 and he finished off a series of videos called the Hammer Film Collection. It's his own personal Hammer Horror Film Collection with advice on which ones have got slip covers, which ones are in collection box sets, how he started his collection and a discussion on which ones he considers to be classic and which ones that not so classic and ones he might even avoid if it were for the fact that he loved Hammer Horror so much. So he did that in a subscription unboxing. And that pretty much rounds up what I watched on YouTube, apart from your stuff. So when it comes to your stuff, what have I watched this week? These are the standout ones that I managed to get around and watch. Uh, Down the Rabbit Hole is at the top. I saw him, um, and he was just demonstrating a Vectrix game called Xantis, which I really, really liked. I did mention to him I thought it was lacking a second screen. I'd encourage you to go and look at that video and make your own decision up. The Vectrex is one of those lovely systems, one of the ones that I wish I still had. Um, but if I did still have it, um, Xantis is the type of game I would be playing. No word of a doubt on that. And then he took us around the Vancouver Retro Gaming Expo. So... Obviously, he's had some sort of like, um, you know, event where all people uh, meet up. You can watch, you can see some YouTubers there, table events, playing arcade games, stuff where you can buy all your old retro tech at. Um, and he took us kindly around. And I think he showed a picture at one point of John Hancock, who's got his own channel. John Hancock is a well established. Um, video retro game guy mostly very old early stuff like Atari VCS Coleco in television but brings it up to modern day with the Evercades and so forth if you haven't checked out that channel as well do so uh, then we move to Robert's Retro Gaming um, he continues along the line of Minecraft and Dwarf Fortress now I might be wrong with my figures here but I think he's up to episode 31 or 32 of Minecraft and over episode 18 or 19 of Dwarf Fortress. I try to keep myself up to date as much as possible. I do watch these not quite so closely as I used to because I'm not playing Minecraft at the moment and I haven't got Dwarf um, Fortress. But it's not sometimes whether you've got something. It's sometimes about the enjoyment of watching somebody else play a game. I can see myself going round Roberts, say, uh, to have a conversation and then get totally engrossed watching him play a game. Do you know what I mean? I mean, continue to talk to him while he's playing his game. That's what I used to do back in the day, and it's it's that sort of friendly atmosphere that makes me continue to watch. Yeah. Then we've got Steve's Gaming. Um, he continues his ZX Nightmares. He's on episode three now. Um, some standout ones that were in there were Play Your Cards Right, um, Kung Fu Master, and Breakthrough. That, but there are more games in there. It really was funny this week. Um, he was doing Play Your Cards Right. He couldn't quite remember the game show, although he could. But he forgot that in that game, where you ask 100 people and you get it right. The first thing that you can do is that you, if you move on through the board, going higher and lower, if you've ever seen the game, you can freeze at any point. And the advantage of freezing is the next time you win the next the question, you could change the card. So, of course, when he was playing it, and because he wasn't ever getting to the end, he got very close at one point. He was going back to the first base card, which was a queen every time. That card's never going to change unless you tell it to change. And queen's a good card anyway, but you still didn't get to the end. 
That was so funny. I was keep going, can't you see the letter? It says F for freeze. Use F for freeze. For God's sake, freeze. I was like that with him. <laughs> I get so graphic and, um, and anim 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 animated when I'm watching Steve's games. It's great. Um, now, I'm mentioning Main Meister because he's not been very well just recently. He's getting better. Um, we've missed him a little bit, but he did do a Sunday stream last week, and there will be a Sunday stream, I'm sure, today. Um, so bear with that, guys, because his output is so important to us. Um, and, you know, when, you, when you're not very well, it's not very nice either. And it's great to hear that he's feeling so much better. Then we get to Colin Jones, who I mentioned earlier, Ponder. He did a cycle adventure, volume 181. Now, I'm not going to say to you guys, go out now and watch 181 videos of cycling adventures, because these cycling adventures are, are great, because they're informative of what they're trying to do. The amount of people that are going through red lights, that are going into bus lanes, that are corner cutting you up, Colin has done the right thing. He's got a perox he's got a proximity meter um, for people that are getting too close. He follows the rules. And he see all these delivery people going, oh, rules don't apply to me. I'm gonna go straight through. Um, but I do know that they're under pressure as well. If they don't do something within a set time, they don't get their money. But we should all follow the rules, especially the rules of the road. Um, let's cut the death rate down, shall we, for people on the road. And watching these videos, you'll see just how bad it is. And then we come to Magdalena. And I'm going to keep saying that name because I've got that bit right. It's the surname I can't do now, I think. So Magda K or Magdalena, as I know it has, she's really going head for head tilt forward with her projects so we had nothing for a couple of months and she's now starting to um, get her apartment looking right um, she's building shelves um, she's cooking polish dishes um, showing off her new apartment and she's later on obviously going to extend her portfolio of some little basic exercises that we could all do with you know, stuff you could do in-house. So definitely a channel to watch um, as as that channel is now starting um, to bring out more output and give us life lessons. That's the word I was looking for. And then we've got LFC Gamer and Vlogs. He did a blog yesterday. Brilliant it was. He started to collect VHS tapes and he wanted to talk a little bit about YouTube comments going missing. We feel your pain. FC, I definitely do with the comments that disappear. Absolutely atrocious. Um, VHS tape um, collecting, nothing wrong with it. More quill to your bow, matey. I will say this. Um, the problem that with VHS tape now is not really probably the tape anymore. It's more to do with the heads of the player. I've still got my video players. They're upstairs. But I do know that the heads on them must be harder to get hold of now or a line. There are so many break points inside a video recorder that makes that tech difficult. Um, but you carry on, matey. Nothing wrong with that. And I just wanted to do a quick shout-out that Denny has got a video coming out today uh, on Invincible Island, which was a text adventure back in the day. And it may not sound like very exciting, but the production values, the amount of effort and work that's gone into this, and how, how informative and... What's the word? How fresh it is to see this type of video on YouTube. Can't fault it at all absolutely wonderful take what you need out of it the nostalgia element or the walkthrough element of it or both like i did so absolutely brilliant
That's out this afternoon. Please watch it. Then we've got what I watched on TV this week. Um, Star Trek Strange New World Season 2 Episode 3 was a time travel story. Um, you could say that last week's court story was disappointing. I'd say this story was more disappointing because it's, it's more time travel, multiverse, blah, 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 in your ear type of story with fan favourite. Oh, let's bring Captain Kirk into it. You see what I mean? And from that point of view, I could forget it. And I I wouldn't have cared if I'd have seen it or not. Secret Wars Season 1 Episode 2 is a continuation of last week. It wasn't bad at all. Very engrossing. It's picking up pace nicely. And the arc I've already talked about, which is on Sky, we're up to Episodes 5 and 6. So four episodes away now from the end. And although a formulatic show, great. Still not bad to watch. It's one of those ones, I've got a spare hour or two. I'm going to watch this, switch my brain off, and just uh, enjoy myself. And then we've got my stuff. So as you know, I did a blog. And I did a, a garden project blog as well. So I showed off a little bit about my garden. And the blog last week was, as you've commented on, um, I did a live stream, though, on on Friday, which I hope you guys will watch, even as a rerun. Um, it would have been nice to have seen you there. But it was an enjoyable show. I showed off Diablo 4 and A Hero Song, two totally different types of games. Diablo 4 I wanted to show because I finally got it to get be stable. And that game to get to get to work is is a damn hard thing to do with its memory leak problem at the moment. Now I don't want that to put people off buying the game because they will patch it. But at the moment it does have a memory leak, which means that it can crash because the amount of video RAM that's been used. Um, I can give you tips if you want, but they are inside pretty much the video. And uh, the reason I showed you that um, microphone is I won this in an auction. Now, if you look up Blue Yeti X, it's $159.99. Somebody mentioned in my blog about clicking noises, and it started to annoy me because there's only so much that I can do. So... I looked at the cheapest Blue Yeti bids that were out there, and there was this one that ended at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, had zero bids. And it said, brand new, never opened, don't want it, basically. Put a tenner on it. Postage and packing was £15. I thought, yeah, I don't mind paying 25 quid for something, taking a gamble. And I won it. And I couldn't believe it. I was the only bidder. And I dare say it was because of the time of day that the auction ended. So the £15 paid for postage that got the, the item to me within two days. So I needed something. I needed to review some things. And this is where I use YouTube to review things. Like what's the best sound arm, you know, um, microphone arm. What's the best shock absorber absorbents you can buy for it how do you set it up um what's the good points what's the bad points so i watched a number of those um and i had immense time brilliant so in that stream you'll hear the first parts of the new mic this whole blog has been recorded with the new mic and i hope it comes through sharp for you and then The other thing is there's a refund that I got on a steel book. Now, I'm going to explain that right now to you. So I'm going to put this to one side because I usually do my what um, what I've uh, bought this week. And this turned up, creep show. Oh, I do this on a different camera, don't I? There we go. So creep show on steel book come, but if you look, it's bent to hell. 
absolutely atrocious. And I wasn't happy. And because it wasn't direct from Amazon, it was through a another sort of like a third party that works with Amazon. A distributor is what I would say. <clears throat> it would have cost me a tenner to get my money back. So I was never, ever going to get my money back fully because they won't refund you until it comes back. So I explained this to Amazon on the phone. I said, I'm not very happy about this because your policy when you buy something, although you make it clear to read all the terms and conditions, a lot of us don't read them all. And this particular one is too harsh. What I mean by that is, this guy was supposed to send out a delicate item and he put it inside a jiffy bag that basically it would have got knackered if it was if it was posted domestically. The fact it was going internationally should have meant that he should have packaged it up in a um, cardboard, hardboard lining wrapper. Yeah, But he didn't and that's why it's bent to buggery. I won't accept this and I want the my money back. But I would accept um, the item to keep minus how much it would cost me to send it back. So if you'd like to refund me all but £10 of the item, I'm happy to keep it. After much to and from him, he agreed to that. So I got a happy ending. But I had to jump through hoops for it. And the company, I don't, I'd never trade with them again. I know that. East Berlin Distribution, something like that they're called. Um, because he, he mentioned the next time that you want to order from us, um, Dale Boy, it, it basically stated, um, please let us know you're in a different country and we will endeavour to put it in better packaging. You're a distributor of media. You should know that nobody will accept jiffy bags anymore. So that was the end of that. Now I've got two versions of Avatar. And the reason for that is one's 3D and one's 4K, both steel books. Um, yes, I've still got a 3D telly upstairs, so that was important to me. 4K, because that's the media that we use now. Haven't got round to seeing uh, those on physical media, but I have watched it at the cinema and I have watched it on Disney+. Plus. <clears throat> then we got The Walking Dead Season 11, The Complete, which the year that this came out, Walking Dead Season 11, was in two parts. So they put the two parts and released it as one box set, which is nice. Steel book, nice sort of like shiny cover. Can't see that. And The Walking Dead, I think we all know what that show is. And then, who knew, Jurassic Park is 35 this year. And this is a commemorative pack for Jurassic Park. So I could not buy it, if you see what I mean. Lots and lots of extras. I'll put that up in case you want to freeze frame it. There we go. Um, and there's, there was only one other subject to do which I'll try and cover after the media. But if it if it goes on too far, I might have to do this again, Denny, the following week. I do apologise. But I got a lot out, I have to say. So I'm going to change to media playback. There we go. And minimise my all those questions that you guys lovely gave me. And we're going to watch some of the things that I bought this week, which I've just shown you. Um, I never want to take this section out. So I'm going to mute the microphone now and I hope that you enjoy it. So I'll just do that and see you on the other side. For entertainment on broadcast television, you can order our next feature at the push of a button. They've got all my favorite movies on cassette. Over 10,000 videos. And it's really disgusting. And it's really, really good. Thanks. I'll just look around. I'm sure I'll find something.
but I feel her. I hear her heartbeat. She's so close. So what does her heartbeat sound like? Let you bring your war here. Outcast. That's all they see. I see you. The way of water connects all things. Before your birth. And after your death. This is our home! I need you. With me. And I need you to be strong. spent the last five years setting up a kind of biological preserve. What kind of park is this? We've made living biological attractions so astounding that they'll capture the imagination of the entire planet. It's, it's a dinosaur. There's no doubt our attractions will drive kids out of their minds. Grandpa! We're gonna make a fortune with this place. We're going to open next year. That is if the lawyers don't kill me first. What species is it? It's a velociraptor. Park will open with the basic tour you're about to take. Don't you see the danger shown inherent in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen. You wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. These are aggressive living things that have no idea what century they're in, and they'll defend themselves violently if necessary. Dinosaurs and man, two species separated by 65 million years of evolution, just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together. How can we possibly have the slightest idea of what to expect? Hey, what'd I touch? Uh, you didn't touch anything. We stopped. Anybody hear that? It's a, um... It's an impact armor is what it is. Maybe it's the power trying to come back on. What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? Fences are failing all over the park. Fairly alarmed here. Hold on to your butt. Oh no. People who love. Which is just a delay. That's all it is. All major theme parks have delays. Yeah, yeah. But John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't eat the tourists.
have been right all the time. <clears throat> and there we go. <clears throat> I hope you got some enjoyment out of that media. <clears throat> One of those I forgot to show the box set on. And I'd normally do it in that camera, but it was this Arrow Video 80s box set of films. You can see the dolls, robot jocks, etc. Um, lovely box. Um, everybody's raving about it. I'm looking forward to opening it up. A couple of these I'd already seen. I'd already seen Robot Jocks uh, and Cellar Dweller. I haven't seen, I don't think, Dolls or Arena. And, of course, uh, the other one is Dungeon Master, so I'm looking forward to those. And looking at the time, 2 hours 10, <clears throat> I apologise for that, but I had stuff that I needed to talk about and make up for. And the last one was a big question that Denny had, which... I need to do justice to, but I will touch upon it now and I'll probably do a, a better episode. He's a big collector of films and cartoons and stuff like me. He knows that John Romita has just died and Spider-Man is one of my heroes. And he wanted to know what I thought of the first sort of like Spider-Man cartoons in particular, the 1967 <coughs> Spider-Man series the 1981 Spider-Man series, the 1982-3 Spider-Man series, and then the 1990s Spider-Man series, and not to go any further. <clears throat> it's an interesting question, because there's a metamorphosis of stuff that goes on through all of those that really require me to talk about for you know, a good 10, 15, 20 minutes. But I will give you some background now on the 60s Spider-Man. <clears throat> I think everybody knows of the 60s Spider-Man. Um, the theme tune is well-known. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web. You know, we all know it. But we all probably saw it at different parts of our lives. And... To the American audience, you probably saw it on Saturday mornings <clears throat> in the cartoon uh, section, you know, cartoon hour or cartoon two hours. Um, and it would have been on your non-satellite public broadcasting system. In Britain, it was different. Um, we wouldn't have got it until early 70s. And I remember it was definitely the early 70s that I saw it. And at that particular time, it was shown not on the BBC, which was on every TV channel station. It would have been on the ITV network. <clears throat> and the ITV network, therefore, was separated by districts. What I mean by that is, you think about the whole of England, you think of them all as counties. Those counties made up districts those districts would have been broadcast districts so midlands would have been atv um looking further south you'd have had southern televisions stv um looking at yorkshire and north you'd have had uh, granada and htv and it goes on scottish tv is stv um etc etc now London is the biggest broadcaster, and that was Thames Television later on, or the ITV1 network. And core programs were done through that particular voice. So, in other words, on a Saturday, all the transmitters switched to Thames Television, and you watched at five o'clock what London was going to be watching, right? No choices, really. Regional would have been when the when the news came on. This meant that Spider-Man was not bought 
by Thames Television. It was bought by each district. And so each district would have shown it at different times. Some of them would have had it on a Saturday morning. Some of them would have had it on a weekday before the news and in the children's section, etc., etc., etc. ATV took an age to get Spider-Man for me. And back in the day, <clears throat> because I knew how to change a plug and all sorts of stuff, you know, I was only four or five-year-old whippersnapper, I knew how to tune the TV in. So we had a little panel on our push TV, you know, no remotes, push TV. There was a panel that you pushed and it slid down, sort of like a, a drawer coming down. And there would have been a tuning peg and you'd have seen all the UFO, UA, UHF channels. And basically, you got the peg, and you, you went between bands turning this peg round. And your aerial on your roof, depending on how good the aerial was and which direction it was pointing, whether it was pointing to your local transmitter or slightly skew if, you could basically tune into the other districts. And I managed to tune in and get a okay-ish, but very, very ghosty, southern television channel <clears throat> now that that might be because our area was in the wrong place so i managed to watch spider-man at 7 a.m on southern television before atv got it and they were showing they showed it during the week um at 5 30 between 5 30 and 5 45 now because of that Southern had it on as a 25-minute segment and ATV, my area, had it as a 10-minute segment. And that's because season one was made up of more was made up of singular episodes of 10 minutes or singular episodes of 22 minutes. Which would have made it very difficult for an ATV to show the 22-minute stories of season one but they could have split it into two somehow. Um, so all I'm trying to get at here was Spider-Man was important to me because my father bought me my comic and I now managed to see an animated version of him. There was obviously toys <clears throat> where I, we had Viewmaster. I don't know if you remember Viewmaster. We're going a, a bit tangent here. But you used to have a 3D projector type thing where you it spun round and you saw cells from the from the TV show, and those were in 3D. And you could actually get a torch version of it and broadcast it onto the um, wall. But we didn't have any sound, so there were. There was a projector type system that had a cassette that you that you turned round, and it would then broadcast in the wall, and you heard the sound. But you had to turn the crank the handle round at the right speed to hear the sound. So the TV was the best part of showing it, and when it was eventually shown, they did show all of the seasons, um, and that was my introduction to the '60s Spider-Man. It was better than the other Marvel cartoons, but shockingly distributed in this country that other TV shows are more fondly remembered in um, this country. So you can imagine there would have been Marine Boy, Sinbad the Sailor, all the Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies, Tom and Jerry, all of those, much more well-known. Spider-Man, what the hell's that? And it's a shame, because although it has limited animation, you can definitely see its budget seriously cut. And although the villains are not like the comic, it was the only Spider-Man thing out there, and it was so much better than the other Marvel cartoons which were four Captain America 
Submariner. And Iron Man. And the Hulk, of course. So, those used what they call static animation, where they took the comic book cell, you know, panels, and then just animated the mouths and told the story as verbatim from the comic. Spider-Man was more, this is fully animated. Him web-swinging is nothing like any cell out of any comic book, and uh, therefore we're, we're, we're going much more verbose than any other Marvel cartoon done at that particular time. And that's why it lasted as many seasons as it did compared to the Hulk and the Four and all that, which were one seasons. That's all they were, one season. Uh, five, I believe, for the 60s Spider-Man. 67 to 72, yeah. And then we don't hear nothing until 81, and this is where I'm going to have to stop because of the time it's going to take. I loved my time with the 60s Spider-Man, and I still watch it now. The music in it is just out of this world. It's the old way of doing music in cartoons. It's where you write a theme, and you can then mix and match these themes into every other cartoon, and you'll have a different score each week. But... There is a main theme for fighting, a main theme for web swinging, a main theme for um, mystery, a main theme for shock, a main theme for... Do you see what I mean? And whenever these things happen in the cartoon, they play these snippets of tunes. And they're all from the 60s, so it's very jazzy, <coughs> poppy type music. And with that, I'm going to say salute and thank you. You will get more of me with the Spider-Man cartoon, because it's too big a subject for me to let go. But it's going to have to be a special. And I've got no qualms in doing that, because how much Spider-Man means to me. I hope the sound is better, and I hope the lip sync has, has gone away. And with that, I'm looking forward to your comments even more this week than any other week, to know how this one worked out, because I am sorry it's gone on way too long. But obviously, next ones will be better. With that, salute and thank you so much for watching. And until next week, bye-bye.